All right, here we go. Let's go. Listen. Uh, David Parker Ray, the Toy Box Killer, full documentary. So we're gonna watch this. Um, I when we were talking about the Dahmer, sh somebody told me that this guy is worse than Dahmer, uh, and told me to watch this on stream. So, uh, we're gonna give it a shot. We're gonna watch it and just see what happens. And uh, if this guy's really worse than Dahmer, like I would be surprised. Like I'm, I'm, I'm gonna bet he's not just based off of what I've seen. You know, Dahmer literally. Murdered and eight people, but you know, let's see. Let's see what happens. Here we go. Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Hello there, bitch. I'm going to tell you in detail why you have been kidnapped, what's going to happen to you. You are obviously here against your will. You're going to be kept chained in a variety of different positions, usually with your legs or knees forced wide apart. You'll be raped thoroughly and repeatedly in every hole you've got. <laughs> You're going to be drugged up real heavy with a combination of sodium pentothal and phenobarbital. You're not going to remember a thing about this little adventure or what has happened to you. Why is it called the toy box killer? Bro, if, in Butte, New Mexico. if this is about little kids, bro, I'm going to be sick to my stomach, bro. A quiet retirement community two hours north of the Mexican border. Only about 700 households. Nothing ever happens here. You know your neighbor and everyone else in town, and they know you. You get up. You go to work. You see the same people, see the same places day after day. It's the kind of town that's so small and quiet... It's not uncommon for people to leave their homes unlocked. With an average income of $30,000 a year, it's not like you have anything worth stealing anyway. The idea of anything out of the ordinary or newsworthy happening in this town is pretty much inconceivable. Other than a few troublesome kids now and then getting into mischief, nobody really ever has anything to worry about. escape March 12, 1999 22 year old Cynthia Virgil Jaramillo is running for her life down a dirt road covered in blood wearing nothing except for a metal choker collar padlocked to her neck like an escaped animal running for her life her attacker hot on her trail she desperately tried to orientate herself, shaking off the numerous amounts of forced drugs in her system designed to make her delirious, forgetful, compliant. She had no idea where she was, what day it was, where she could go. Can you had change it, the picture? A couple of days? A week? She could only guess how much time had passed since she was taken captive. With no idea where she was, she only knew that she had to get away. And the danger was closing in on her fast. Finally, a trailer. A sign of civilization. She had no idea if it was safe. Only knowing that the alternative was far worse. She had to try. She barged into the trailer. The homeowner startled and shocked at the bloody, bruised, and panicked naked woman barging uninvited into their home. Oh my god. It was immediately apparent that she was in trouble. Cynthia begged and pleaded with them to keep her safe, crying and pleading in hysterics as she tried to explain what had just happened to her. She collapsed on the floor and fell unconscious. What had she been through? The homeowner called the police who promptly came and rescued her and arrested the man by the name of David Parker Ray. Oh, hell no! Hell no! You know those dudes, they just look like they're a murderer, bro? You know what I mean? 
I don't want to say the R word, but he, you know, he, he's looking like that. A man they would soon learn would be the stuff of nightmares that even seasoned investigators would have a hard time coping with. Yeah, he looks like a Bryce. He looks like a Bryce. He looks like a Bryce, if you know what I mean. Los Parker Ray Polos. Hey, guys, I would appreciate if when you make jokes, you don't try to insinuate that I'm a murderer or a Bryce. I, like, I would just appreciate that. That's all I ask. If you could do that, we'd be fine. That's it. I don't think I'm asking for anything insane. I, 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 think, I'm, I think I'm being reasonable. So... David Parker Ray was a troubled man. Dude, why? I'm, dude, I'm, first of all, usually the day streams are really chill. What the hell is this? This is looking like it's nighttime, bro. Got these psychos out in the chat spamming low stomper. From the start, he was raised by his grandparents after his violent, severely alcoholic and abusive father, Cecil. Left the family and moved to Albuquerque. Abusive father named Cecil? Oh, hell no, bro. His mother, Nettie, couldn't handle the stress of raising 10-year-old David and 8-year-old Peggy. So she dropped them off with their paternal grandparents and moved back in with her own family. The children rarely saw their own parents ever again. And neither their mother or father had any apparent bond with their children thereafter. David's grandfather raised them in an oppressively strict Christian fundamentalist environment. Misbehavior of any kind was met with violent beatings. A friend of David's would later describe his terror of his friend David's grandfather, saying, his grandfather was very, very strict. He came from the old school where you had to be tough to survive. Bro, I'm not gonna get called Los Wayne Gacy, bro. I'm not getting, I'm not doing this, Los Bundy. Yo, yo, do I have mods during the day? Someone just said Los Bin Laden, bro. What is this? Can we just watch a video? If his grandfather Adolf Polos Yo wanted David to do something, he'd jump. Maybe in today's terms he was abusive, but we called it being strict. Everywhere David went, he was exposed to violence and bullying. His father tormented him and beat him. Both his parents disposed of him. His oppressive grandfather beat him often and expected him to meet standards that hardly anyone could ever meet. And he was bullied and beaten at school so mercilessly. He was a loner, shy and reserved, and hardly opened up to anyone. He spent most of his time alone on his grandfather's ranch. The results of endless torment and beatings from everyone in his life had a profound influence on him and his development into puberty. His sister described finding lewd and violent pornographic images hidden in the- Alright, bro! Pablos Escobar! Nah! From when he was 13. His tastes for violence and bondage was early and never left him. Not only did it never leave him, it grew. According to multiple sources who knew him best, he boasted to the few people close to him that his first murder was at a very young age, as a young teenager, where he abducted a woman at knife point, tied her to a tree, and tortured her to death. Years went by as he became more deeply involved with sadomasochism and violence. He got married twice and met his third wife at the age of 27, 18-year-old Glenda Burdine in 1966. They had a daughter named Glenda Jean Ray the following year, whose importance to this story cannot be overstated, and you'll hear more about her later. Three years after the birth of their daughter, David grew bored and left his family to join the hippie revolution in 1969. By this time, David, at the age of 30, was hitchhiking across New Mexico with a pretty blonde girl named Sally. They shacked up with the owner of a truck stop and his girlfriend. David's now pregnant girlfriend, Sally, confided in the girlfriend of the truck stop owner that she had lost her virginity to David and that she was pregnant. Days later, Sally and all her possessions were gone. 
When they asked David where Sally was, he shrugged, saying that she was a free spirit and had decided to leave. As disturbed as they were about this behavior from Sally, which they considered to be out of character after having gotten to know her, they had no reason to disbelieve David, and Sally was soon forgotten. What? David shortly thereafter got bored of the hippie lifestyle as well, patched things up with his wife, and moved back in with his family. Although he pretended to be the consummate father figure, he was anything but, getting deeper and deeper into the underground bondage scene. The years continued onward. The underground what scene? Deeper and deeper into the underground bondage scene. Dude, what? All right, bro. The years continued onward. Two more failed marriages, and David moved to the quiet community of Elephant Butte, New Mexico in the 80s, where he would take up residence at 513 Bass Road the remainder of his life. Elephant Butte? That's a weird-ass name. The quiet, sleepy town of Elephant Butte was the perfect place to hide a dark secret. A small retirement community of only about 700 homes, situated right on the shores of Elephant Butte Lake, an enormous reservoir of deep, opaque, algae-filled water. He spent most of the 80s getting deeper and deeper into the bondage community, becoming exposed to habits and deviancy and networked contacts that fueled his unbridled thirst for violence and torture. His behavior became well established, kidnapping women and young girls, torturing them for days to satisfy his deviant cravings, and then selling them into slavery in Mexico once he was done with them, conveniently only a two-hour drive south from his new lair in Elephant Butte. It's worth noting that by 1984 he had begun boasting to his friends about his intimate knowledge about every square inch of Elephant Butte Lake, spending countless weekends there in his sailboat. He enjoyed water sports, boat parties, fishing. Bruh. Though the lake had several species of fish, it was best known for the yellow and flathead catfish that prowl its depths, reaching up to 80 pounds, and known for being voracious omnivores, eating anything and everything it came in contact with, including the occasional meal of human remains. David had a reputation of being Lowe's, no troll, I'd sleep you like Jordan Poole. Yo, Hoodie, why do you think that you can just threaten violence like that? Like, just because, oh, this is a stream, you can just, just run in and be like, yeah, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna sleep you, bro. Like, imagine if you were at work and you said that to a coworker, or like, like another student at school, or you just walked up to someone in, in, in Target. Like, bro, you're getting arrested, dude. You're getting arrested. I would slap you in my cock. All right, all right, bro. All right, bro. A kind right, bro. and gentle person. Oh, by the way, speaking of vets and, you know, whatever, uh, Tino, I uh, couldn't make it to the vet this time with him, but he went to the vet today, and he is 15.6 pounds. Last time we went, uh, it was three weeks ago, he was 11 pounds. So, he's four months old. They said the max that he can get to is 15 to 30. That's what they said his max. He's already at 15.6. He was kind to animals and routinely found injured animals to nurse back to health. A stark contrast to the darkness he secretly hid all his life. Friends who assumed he was speaking darkly hypothetical recall him describing while on his boat the best places in the lake to hide a body. He described the need to cut them open to release outgassing, fill the cavity with stones, wrap them in chicken wire, and after dumping them in the lake, the catfish would take care of the rest. And the zero visibility and algae in the water meant that no one would ever find what the catfish didn't take care of themselves. David Ray's daughter, Glenda Jean Ray, who went by the nickname Jessie, was the spitting image of her father who she adored. She rarely saw her father who was constantly traveling, 
working odd mechanical jobs. Growing up, she was exposed at a very young age to her father's masochistic lifestyle, who did little to hide his deviancy from her. She grew up with not only a tolerance for it, but developed similar cravings and deviancy that she saw in her father. She only recognized that there was a problem with her father at the age of 19, when she witnessed a bondage torture session with a prostitute that resulted in the woman screaming for her life, fleeing naked out of David Ray's home in terror, never to return. She filed a complaint with the FBI and gave a sworn complaint against her father. The astonished FBI agents listened as she told tale after tale of her deviant father kidnapping and torturing women and later transporting them to Mexico, selling them all into sexual slavery. After bringing then 46-year-old Ray in for questioning himself several times, not only did he not hide his behavior, he gleefully told them in graphic, enthusiastic detail about his deviant lifestyle, telling them that he had been interested in bondage since the age of 13 and had been extremely active I'm in not re Restarting! Stop asking me to restart! What the hell is wrong with you, bro? Every comment is saying restart. Bondage community since the age of 28. Even telling the FBI agents that it was difficult for him to be satisfied until he thought of murder. As Bro. shocking and deviant as his behavior was, there was no specific crime that they could pinpoint, no victim that they could identify. Although they had a near confession from him, they were forced to close the report without further action, leading to another 13 years kidnappings, torture, and murder. One of Jesse's best friends told reporters years later, this is like the last time Jesse tried to break away, to say to her dad that she saw his behavior and said, no, this is wrong. And she reported him, and what happens? They didn't do anything. It was indeed the first and only time that Jesse cooperated with law enforcement about her father. It's believed that after this experience with the FBI, Jessie began to fully embrace who her father was, and he kept no secrets from her. People who knew them best described their relationship as close. Uncomfortably close. What is bondage? Let me Google it. What is bondage? The state of being a slave. Sexual practice that involves the tying up or restraining of a partner. Jessie gave birth to a daughter herself a few years later in 1990, denying all the constant rumors that the biological father was David Ray, her own father. Emboldened by his brush with the FBI, who had failed to pin him down for his decades of crimes, David Ray decided to push his deviancy and thirst for violence into a realm unseen before. An unparalleled mechanic and craftsman, Ray married his skills and passion for violence, torture, and unbridled deviancy into what would be his magnum opus, a kind of laboratory where he could put his decades of experience into the art of pain into practice. He purchased a 22 foot long cargo trailer, hung up a handmade sign right inside that read Satan's Den, and he got to work. He installed an air conditioning unit to keep himself comfortable inside. The toy box, as he called it, would be a constant work in progress over the years. It's estimated that he personally invested over $100,000 into it. It was escape-proof, sound-proof, with a reinforced frame and a deadbolt lock. The ceilings and walls were adorned with unimaginable horrors. Elaborate systems of pulleys, gurneys, weights, pliers, clamps, whips, scalpels, chains, padlocks, drawings and figurines of women in various methods of torture. Medical cabinets filled with syringes and chemicals. There was a coffin lined with ventilation holes and various rings to restrain his victims as he sealed them shut inside. And most horrifying of all, an actual medical grade 
gynecological chair, modified to restrain victims, and positioned limbs as he saw fit, positioned in the center of the toy box like a throne of pain. Hooked up to the head and the midsection were electrodes that he attached to a generator used to electrocute various parts of their bodies. In a move of absolute evil arrogance, he set up video recording equipment to film his dark crimes, installing monitors positioned so that his victims would be forced to watch themselves as he inflicted unimaginable pain upon them. It's believed that he filmed every single session, selling the footage to his dark network of contacts in the underground bondage world, who had a high interest and were happy to pay top dollar for the most extreme footage and even snuff films that he shot. His captive victims would be kept for days, sometimes up to three months in unimaginable conditions. Always careful to clean up and leave no trace of evidence, he made sure that none of his victims could be identified in the footage. He kept them until he was bored with them. No one ever saw the inside of the toy box unless you were a victim of it or a captor. It always began the same way, and he never deviated from his time-tested methods. His victim was abducted from the road, a bar, or by luring a prostitute into his shabby RV, violently beaten and shackled. He would take them back to 513 Bass Drive, keep them captive, chained to the bed, as he inflicted unimaginable amounts of pain. And then days later, they would be blindfolded and brought to the toy box. When the blindfold was removed, they found themselves strapped to the gynecological chair. Looking around, they would see the various tools of torture, syringes, other items that I'm too uncomfortable to hear myself bro, say out loud. Bro. They would see David Ray hovering over them like a victorious predator. Bro. Then he would play the tape. His frequency of bringing new victims in led to him being tired of giving them the instructions himself so he made a taped set of audio instructions, a kind of orientation to prepare his victims for the true nightmare to begin. I'm unwilling to read the words aloud, but you heard a part of the original audio of that tape at the beginning, and I'll leave a link to a pastebin post with the full transcript of what each of his victims heard before... This is sick. This I, I don't even want to began. watch this anymore, bro. At the end of their captivity, I don't want to watch they would anymore. be washed, thoroughly scraped of any DNA evidence, given the clothes that they had come in months before, after months of being naked, and given a cocktail of very powerful hallucinogenic drugs that made them forget the entire ordeal completely, unable to identify what had happened to them or even explain to their loved ones why they hurt so badly all over or where they had been for so long. It's impossible to know how many victims saw the horrors of the toy box, but years later, the FBI would find hundreds and hundreds of tapes and photographs of his victims and their time inside. None would be identifiable, except one and it was all thanks to a blurry image of a tattoo. And this tattoo led them to one of the most important witnesses who helped convict David Ray. The tattoo was blurry and hard to make out, but after enhancing the video as best they could, they released an image of the tattoo. A woman named Kelly Van Cleve soon came forward recognizing her own tattoo. She had spent time in Elephant Butte and was missing three days of her life that she couldn't account for, followed by severe bouts of depression, anxiety, and nightmares. Bro. Wait, so he wouldn't even kill them? Wait, how do you just erase someone's mind? I'm so confused. So he would, like, drug them to the point where they couldn't remember? Like before? 
How could you erase three months of someone's memory? No, she was three days. But then they, she, he said shit about people being there for months. Why do you want to know, weirdo? All right, bro. All right, bro. All right, fine. Okay, bro. Okay. Yeah. In the summer of 1996, Kelly Van Cleve was a regular patron at a bar called Raymond's Lounge in the nearby town of Truth or Consequences. A year earlier, a woman named Jill Troya disappeared and hadn't been seen since after a bitter argument with Jesse Ray, David Ray's daughter. It's now assumed, but never proven, that Jesse was responsible for the disappearance. Kelly was having a rough time in a new marriage that she had rushed into, and had become good friends with Jesse Ray, David's daughter. One night, after a particularly nasty fight with her brand new husband, she stormed out and headed to Raymond's lounge to drink and vent her frustrations. She talked to Jesse about her difficulties and had a single beer. Other patrons and friends of hers left, and it was only her and Jesse. Feeling uneasy and disoriented from the drugs that Jesse had slipped her secretly into her beer, she decided she needed to go home. But her ride had long since departed. Jesse offered her a place to stay at her father's home in Elephant Butte and drove her there, where she was held at knife point bound and introduced to the toy box by Jesse and her father. Three days later, David Ray drove her home to the in-laws, telling them that he found her wandering the beach in a disoriented state. As he returned her, they were fuming, assuming she had gone off on some sort of drug binge. Her new husband annulled the marriage. He and his mother laid into her viciously, telling her how irresponsible she was for leaving for three days and not telling anyone. Confused, destitute, unable to account for the missing three days, the bleeding that she was experiencing, and the injuries that she couldn't explain. She took the few belongings she had left, and then she left Elephant Butte. Three years later, she was living in Colorado and remarried, but still suffering from the ordeal constant nightmares, depression, and an inability to be intimate with her new husband, or even allow him to see her uncovered. She was haunted by the nightmares of being tortured and suspended in midair. Through psychological counseling, she was able to piece together most of the ordeal that she suffered over the course of three days in David Parker Ray's toy box. She was hardly the first, and certainly not the last victim to experience the horrors that she could now clearly see on the footage the FBI showed her of her helpless naked body being put through unthinkable trauma. The impressionable Roy Yancey was fresh out of the Navy in 1995. Clean cut, proper, considered quite a charmer with the ladies, returned home to truth or consequences. A far cry from the young man who, in the mid-80s, ran with a group of friends who many in the town considered a satanic cult made up of high school-aged renegades. They spent their time wrecking highly organized and unsettling havoc, sacrificing pets of neighbors, delivering messages with occultists. Sacrificing pets of neighbors? Bro. Bro satanic symbols, just to people that they didn't like, and all sorts of mischief considered by police at the time to be criminal acts. Through police investigations, the best lead that the police got were continuous references to someone described as an older man named David, who recently had moved to Elephant Butte a few years prior, but they were never able to definitively confirm who this David was. Fresh out of the Navy with a new determination to walk the straight and narrow this time, he couldn't help but getting back into his old ways after becoming friends with Jesse Ray. The two were considered inseparable by people who knew them best. Although Roy was considered a decent person, he was highly impressionable. This 
This sick fuck. The daughter is helping, bro. And also, why is it called the toy box? Can someone explain this to me? Like, why does it have like a little little cute nickname? Like, why? Like, why are we doing that, bro? The dark side that few saw. Jesse, who knew him best, nurtured this darkness over the course of their friendship. Jesse reintroduced him into the world of occult Satanism, which she had picked up from her father. It's unclear if Satanism was strongly held beliefs or just simply theatrics to complement the copious amounts of bondage and sadomasochism that she and her father practiced. The two became very close friends with a man named Kenneth Lee, a 43-year-old loner from Florida, a flamboyant gay man who was rumored to have a steady supply of drugs. Roy and Jesse visited him frequently. Neighbors described seeing Roy visit him especially often, leaving with a devious smile on his face. It's unclear what really happened, but when police were called to do a welfare check on Kenneth Lee on New Year's Day in 1996, after neighbors had complained of a foul smell coming from his apartment, they found his badly decomposed body in the front room. Splashes of blood were found all around, along with black candles and pentagrams drawn on the table. Amazingly, Kenneth's death was ruled a suicide by metallic poisoning when they found a doorknob lodged in his rectum and his stomach filled with screws and bolts. No charges have ever been filed. In July... Bro, there are fucked up ways to die. If you die from a doorknob in your ass... That's fire. Oh, you're getting timed out, bro. Low-key fire. Oh, you're getting timed out. This guy's sick, bro. See, this is why I don't like to react to some sh shit like this because there's low-key psychos out there. There's low-key psychopaths out there, bro. I have 1997, the following year, a former girlfriend of his that he had at one time been extremely close with, Marie Parker, was in dire financial ruin. Homeless. She pitched a tent on the shores of Elephant Butte Lake and dropped her children off with a friend. Deciding to make a run to score some drugs, she agreed to meet with Jesse and Roy. She ended up at knife point in the back seat of David Parker Ray's truck driven by Jesse, as Roy restrained his former lover in the back seat. According to Roy's confession, they drove to David Ray's home and she was introduced to the toy box. He claims he never went inside where Jesse and her father kept Marie for three days. During that time, police organized a massive search and rescue operation in an effort to find Marie. At the end of the three days, Jesse and her father told Roy that they were done with her, and that it was time for her to go. Then, they brought Roy inside the toy box. Roy claims that he walked inside to find his naked and helpless ex-girlfriend Marie strapped to the gynecological chair. Jesse handed him a rope and said, you know what you have to do. With so much police scrutiny into Marie's disappearance, David and Jesse were going to take no chances with her being found after they got what they wanted from her. David started the video recorder, and Roy approached Marie with the rope. He claims that as Jesse pointed a gun at him, he strangled Marie to death with the rope. The videotape was never found, and it's been hypothesized that David sold the tape as a snuff film, like he had done many other times. In Roy's confession- Bro, uh, dude, saying one is worse than the other, or like, I'm not going to compare him and Jeffrey Dahmer, but if you're saying there were hundreds of films, I think Jeffrey Dahmer had like 20 victims or less. If you're saying there were hundreds- like, I, I'm not going to compare because it's not right to compare. But, dude, this is this is bad, bro. This is, this is like, this could be one of the worst things I've ever seen in my life. 
claims that he, Jesse, and David wrapped her body in a blanket, drove to Monticello Canyon near Truth or Consequences, and tossed her body into the ravine, descending down with shovels to bury it under loose dirt under cover of darkness. The following day, Roy and Jesse left town and went to stay with an acquaintance in Galveston, Texas. They Los, was, Los was right. There needs to be a torture penalty. Uh, bro, I remember I said this shit. I said if I ever had any type of uh, authority or power or anything to make a change, I would add a torture penalty that if you get caught, instead of getting life in prison, if, you're, if your um, crime was that bad that you would be you would just get tortured um not murdered but just tortured but by professionals that like will keep you alive but you'll just be like tortured bro if that was a actual penalty right because think about it the death penalty you just die instantly okay you're dead whatever um and then life in prison okay you're still alive these people who do this sick shit, they they look at it like, all right, well, if I get caught, like I'll be in jail, you know, for life. I'll get food. I'll you know, I'll be able to chill, whatever. Or if I get the death penalty, all right. Like, if you have this possibility that if you get caught, you can get tortured. Think about think about it. Crime would go down. It wouldn't go up. It wouldn't go up. So, if it's not going to go up, the only other thing you can do is go down, dude. And these people would think twice. They would think twice. And I don't know, people are like, oh, dude, it's inhumane. Yeah, okay, it's inhumane what some of these people do to people. Like, this guy? They should have tortured this guy for the rest of his life on Earth. Why just do a death penalty and give him a quick shot or, or a shock and then he's dead instantly? Why would you... Why why get the easy way out? So, that's what I think they should implement. And if you're going to be a serial murderer, a rapist, a, a child, um, um, a pedophile, uh, any, any, any of these horror, horrific things, you should be get, you should be getting tortured. You should be getting tortured in jail. Not in jail, but like a special area of jail where they keep the torture victims. They stayed for an entire year, waiting for the disappearance of Marie Parker to blow over. Years later, Roy led police to the exact spot they buried her, but she was nowhere to be found. Roy speculated that David Ray must have returned later and removed the body depositing it elsewhere no no not a child i meant a, a, a child like a pedophile what how did you misunderstand that bro said a child not kids but i agree as if this okay strange i never said torture kids what the fuck I went to say child predator, but I said child, and then I and then I I remember I stuttered, and then I said pedophile. Of characters needed any more to make this strange story any more complex. That's exactly what happened soon after Roy and Jesse returned to Truth or Consequences a year later. Returning to the local bar scene, <laughs> soon gaining the attention of a woman who had moved to town while they were away, named Cindy Hendy. It was later discovered that Cindy was herself on the run from the law, moving down to truth or consequences to hide from the police in Washington State, with a rap sheet dating all the way back to 1979 with felonies such as larceny, forgery, and drugs, and fraud. She wasn't about to go back to prison after trying to sell cocaine to an undercover cop. In a strange three-way relationship dynamic, Cindy soon began dating Getting kids to gamble, now you want to torture them. Wow, Los. All right, bro, this is ridiculous. I don't even want to watch this anymore, bro. I don't even want to watch this anymore. It's disturbing, and then you guys are getting the wrong idea. Both Jesse and Roy, occasionally using David Parker Ray's trailer as a sort of love nest. Soon, David became involved in the arrangement as well, throwing lewd free-for-all parties with 
everyone sharing everyone. Cindy was especially interested in the bondage scene, and they enthusiastically introduced her to their own personal flavor of it. Except Cindy was not going to be a victim of it. As time went on, she and David became much closer, and the relationship between them became exclusive. Roy had since begun a relationship with a man named David Riviera, and Cindy did her best to become a dutiful housewife figure for David Ray, fixing him lavish meals, cleaning his house, and doing everything that she could to get his affection towards her, trying to fight off the competition of another woman fighting for David Ray's affection at the same time. On Halloween of 1998, David Ray threw a party in his trailer complete with alleged instances of black magic and witchcraft performed by Cindy, who had been recently introduced to witchcraft by Roy Yancey. Dude, do witches exist? Yes or no? Do they exist? If you're watching this on YouTube, I want you to comment down below. Are witches real? Are they real? Is there a witch? Are there witches? Can you cast spells? Let me know. After a supposed black magic sacrifice to the devil, Cindy loudly announced her relationship with David Parker Ray to all the guests in attendance, which many found strange since she was openly also having a relationship with his daughter, Jessie, at the same time. Cindy and David became close very quickly. David found an equal in Cindy, or at least someone impressionable enough and wild enough to be molded into the kind of companion that he desired most. Slowly, he started letting her in closer and closer, revealing more about himself, testing the waters of what she was capable of handling. Finally, it was time to put her to the test. Cindy told David that she was going out of town for a wedding. Leaving him behind without someone to satisfy his deviant carnal desires was unacceptable to him. By this point, she was so far deep into the darkness he brought her into that the suggestion- Um, this is off topic. So, whatever, but, uh, the other day, I, I was, like I said in, earlier in the stream, like, my stomach hurt, so I was taking a shit. Something happened, and I had to, like, quickly, like, go, so I wiped and, like, went, like, I washed my hands, of course, and I had to go take care of something. I had forgot to flush. So... I'm, st I'm in the room, and then this is like hours later, bro. My girl comes in. We're talking. She, she goes in the bathroom. She she yells. I'm like, what? She starts laughing, comes out, and is like, uh, go take care of that in the bathroom. I'm like, what? Bro, I go in there. It's like three-hour-old shit, dude. You all know the worst part? Since it was there for so long, when I flushed it, there was like, it was in the, it was like a, like a smear in the toilet. So I had to scrub that shit with a, with like one of the toilet, toilet brush shits, bro. Moral of the story is, don't forget to flush. Even if something, there's like an emergency or whatever, like, just flush, bro. I always flush. That's it. That's why I'm like so disturbed that this happened. Because I'm like, dude, no one is, no one sees my shit. Like, that would never happen. It happened, dude. And I'm telling you, my head wasn't right because of this fucking dog. I'm not like all like together. So I'm just, hey, just don't forget to flush, bro that he threw her didn't even phase her for a minute they decided that it was time to kidnap a woman to keep as a wait what does that guy say that was more disturbing than this video <laughs> okay okay all right bro ex slave for david while she was away <laughs> bringing her into the toy box he gave her the grand tour and demonstrated on dolls his scientific and methodical practiced art of inflicting pain she eagerly absorbed every word, and he gave her an 18-point list that he had produced through the years of practice at his dark craft. It was a set of instructions for kidnapping and torture. The list is graphic, abhorrent, and I'm unwilling to read it in this video. 
but I'll leave a link to a pastebin post with the list in the description if you really want to read it. Over the next two years I don't or want so, to read it. Cindy I do not want to read it. I don't, but thanks for thinking of, of us. Hendy was no longer an innocent bystander, simply an enabler, or even an accessory. Cindy Hendy became an accomplice, just as deviant, just as cruel, and just as guilty as David Parker Ray himself for the kidnap, torture, and murder of untold women, just as eager to sadistically inflict pain and terror as her hopeful future husband. Dude, no wonder there's cameras everywhere now, bro. Think about all the shit that went down, people getting taken, and there's no cameras. And so it's like there's no way to solve some of these things. No fucking wonder there's cameras everywhere, bro. We need them. We need cameras everywhere for, to, for society, dude. Otherwise, motherfuckers will just do whatever the fuck they want. And obviously they were. I mean, look, I mean, look at the fucking Dahmer shit, bro. And look at this shit. Now, I'm not it saying that nice. it doesn't happen anymore today. I'm just saying that there's more ways to f solve these crimes today because of all the surveillance. When David Parker Ray... And, like, even ring doorbell cameras, bro. Cindy Handy arrived... You should have a ring. If you have an apartment or a house, you should have a ring camera. You should get one. ...in Albuquerque, seeking their next victim. After speaking with a local pimp and offering $30 for services. A 22-year-old Cynthia Virgil Jaramillo stepped into the rusty, beat-up RV. As she entered the black of the camper, Ray produced a badge telling her that they were- We not rich like you, Lowe's. I'm pretty sure they don't even cost 100 bucks. They might cost 100 bucks, maybe. I don't know. Law enforcement. She tried to make a break for it, back the way she came, but she was overpowered by the two of them and a black leather mask slipped over her head, casting everything into blackness. Hours later, she found herself chained and bound, and as the mask was removed, she heard a voice coming from a nearby recording. Dude, I don't want to watch this anymore. I want to just see him get arrested, bro, or, or, or someone sh kills him. I want to see this. Days later, after suffering unspeakable amounts of pain, terror, and abject humiliation at the hands of Ray and Hendy, Cynthia lay inside the house, chained to the bed. David was at work while Cindy was in the kitchen preparing sandwiches. Although she was still chained and locked firmly in place, the keys to her restraints were carelessly left just out of reach. With little time before Cindy would surely come back, she inched her way closer and closer to the keys. Fumbling and trying not to make any noise, she managed to unlock herself. Knowing there was precious little time, she reached for the phone dialing 911. Before she could connect, Cindy burst into the room and they fought ferociously. Cynthia knowing full well that her life was at stake. They punched and kicked and clawed at one another. Cynthia reached out and grabbed a hold of a nearby ice pick and ferociously stabbed Cindy in the skull, leaving a giant gash. After the police rescued her, after she was hiding in the trailer that was previously- Oh, this is the girl that ran away. Oh, let's go, bro. mentioned, the officers received notice of a 911 hang-up call only blocks away. In a town this small, where nothing happens, there was no way that this was not connected. Rushing to 513 Bass Road, the officers banged on the door. Receiving no answer, they allowed themselves in with probable cause of trouble. Finding shattered glass, blood, and endless amounts of pulley systems and chains, they called for backup. They would need far more than backup. What they witnessed in the brief glance around David Parker Ray's home was far more than the tiny police department of Elephant Butte was equipped to handle. Nothing ever happens in Elephant Butte, a small town of 1,300 people, most of them over the age of 65. No one could have expected the absolute pandemonium 
as more than a hundred investigators from the New Mexico State Police and the FBI swarmed the town, and especially 513 Bass Road. Dozens of news stations from around the world, helicopters circling overhead all day, the quiet little town of Elephant Butte, where nothing ever happened, had just been put on the map and was now known throughout the world, but for all the wrong reasons. Wow. Investigators swarmed the small property, dividing it into eight distinct search areas. They were having trouble getting a certain white cargo trailer open, and the keys were nowhere to be found. It took the locksmith only- What the fuck you mean Lewis looks inspired, bro? What the fuck is wrong with you, bro? I, like, I get joking around, but why do you- Now you're, like, painting me out to be a murderer, bro. It's fucking weird now, dude. Like, you're fucking weird for this shit. A few moments to get the deadbolt lock open. FBI Special Agent John Briscoe opened the small door into the cargo trailer and stepped inside. Holy shit. He saw the chair, the syringes, the whips, the chains, strange metallic bars labeled ankle spreader and knee spreader, the satanic imagery adorning the shelves, and a video camera. Could there possibly be actual video evidence of what the hell happened in here? 36-year-old FBI agent Patty Rust crowded around the monitor inside the toy box with a few of her fellow agents as they loaded the first of hundreds of tapes found around the property. Hundreds, bro? All of them hands over their mouths, trying to hide the absolute shock of the things that they saw before them on the screen. Despite years of work covering the worst crimes imaginable, they were still unprepared for what they saw on the screen before them. They'd seen enough for now. They ejected the tape and each exited the toy box. One of them vomited on the ground as soon as they got outside. It was far worse than anything any of them had ever encountered before. Patty was asked to go back inside and create detailed sketches of everything that she found within to hand over to the evidence response team. She did as she was asked. Over the course of five days, she spent hours sketching every detail of every horrible thing that she found in there, getting a closer look at the horrors than anyone would ever feel comfortable with. After five days, she turned in her assignment and was told to go home and get some rest. She returned to her family in El Paso, Texas. Just before midnight that night, she took out a revolver, held it against her head, and ended her own life. Do you understand like how insane, like just witnessing the aftermath of that shit drove someone to suicide, bro. Bro. The preliminary hearing and eventual trial. This fucking sick fuck. Trials of David Parker Ray, Jesse Ray, Roy Yancey, and Cindy Hendy were every bit as intricate, complex, twisted, and dramatic as the case itself and probably deserves its own video on its own. I'll try and get through the most important aspects for the sake of time, though. As evidence was collected and leads were pursued, police arrested not only David Ray and Cindy Hendy, but they also arrested Jesse Ray and Roy Yancey. Jesse never once betrayed her father and never cooperated with the police. She never admitted to the murders that she herself committed or was an accessory to. David Parker Ray proclaimed his innocence, vehemently telling investigators that not only was Cynthia Virgil a willing participant in a bondage session, but so was every other woman who ever entered his toy box, despite mountains of incriminating footage that they had, where the women showed no signs of consent. Cindy vehemently claimed no wrongdoing either, defying all evidence against her. Both of them appeared before the court at their arraignment, facing 93 years in jail each, $85,000 in fines, and bonds of a million dollars. Facing the very real possibility of spending the rest of her life in jail, she became angry with David, blaming him for sucking her into what she later called his stupid bondage fantasies. 
She asked to meet with investigators and gave a full confession to everything she witnessed was a part of what he had told her about the other crimes that he had committed. She told them everything. If what she told them was true, it would make David Parker Ray one of the most sophisticated, thorough, and prolific serial killers in all of American history. Police had already found a map of Elephant Butte Lake with X's marked in various locations and suspected there must be bodies. But this was the first actual link confirming their suspicions. Of particular interest to investigators was her telling of an old boyfriend, Roy Yancey, who told her that he had killed the missing Marie Parker, who had been missing since 1997. Uh, from what I understand is that he's had many years of kidnapping, torturing, and killing women. How did you come up with the idea to, to kill Marie? Uh, that was David Ray Parker's idea. I know they ended up giving me a rope and telling me to, to strangle her. And she wasn't dying fast enough. Okay, but you said she wasn't dying fast enough. Was she struggling or? Yeah, she was struggling. I was told not to tell anybody anything or I was going to be killed and thrown in the ditch. And who told you that? Ah, uh, David. He would soon be brought in and he confessed as well leading police to the place that he, Jesse, and David Ray had dumped the body, only to discover upon their arrival that the body had been moved and disposed of elsewhere. As the trials went on for the kidnapping and torture of Kelly Van Cleve and Cynthia Virgil Jaramillo, with several dramatic moments themselves, David continued to proclaim his innocence. Even as the prosecutor played the enormously incriminating 45-minute orientation tape that he played for his victims, he continued to proclaim that it was all created for entertainment purposes. Are you comfortable right now? I doubt it. Wrists and ankles chained. Gagged. Probably blindfolded. You are disoriented and scared too, I would imagine. You are obviously here against your will. Totally helpless. You've been snatched and brought here. For us to train and use as a sex slave. Sound kind of far out. Well, I suppose it is to the uninitiated, but we do it all the time. It wasn't until he realized how much legal trouble his daughter Jessie was in that he decided to change his tune. In exchange for her immediate release, he would plead guilty to all the charges against him for kidnapping and torturing Cynthia and Kelly. He would accept the maximum sentence in exchange for Jessie walking free from responsibility for her involvement in any of it. How could she say- what? How? In September 2001, facing 12 counts of kidnapping, criminal penetration, and conspiracy to kidnap, Glenda Jean Jesse Ray walked out of prison with time served. What? She was given five years probation and is today a free woman. What? He left prison immediately, victorious and defiant. Roy Yancey, who allegedly killed at least two people himself, accepted a plea deal. He was released on parole in 2011 and is a free man to this day as well, living back in truth or consequences. Incredibly, he's even active on social media. The girlfriend of suspected serial killer David Parker Ray is about to get out of prison next week after serving only about half her sentence. What? Cindy Hendy served only half her sentence. She never expressed any remorse for her crimes, only self-pity for the situation she found herself in suffering for her crimes, blaming David for sucking into his stupid bondage fantasies, as she put it. Although she had numerous infractions while in prison, including possession of contraband and drugs, she walked out of prison on July 15th, 2019, and is now a free woman with no supervision by the state. As vivid and horrifying as the murders were that David Parker Ray committed, he was never convicted for a single one of them. Police believed at the time- Ratio that guy on Twitter? You think I'm gonna tweet at a murderer? You think I'm gonna tweet at a murderer? Yeah, let me go, let me go piss off a murderer, bro. Yeah, that's, yeah, I should do that, bro. The fuck? He was guilty of his men. He 
has 30 murders over the course of his life. A 2011 this jailhouse isn't a joke. interview with Cindy Hendy put the estimate much higher when she mentioned that he had once told her that he had killed at least one per year for the previous four years of his life, beginning at the age of 14 to 15. Police searched the lake, his property, everywhere. They searched for years. They could never locate a single body, despite having mountains of evidence that he had committed countless murders. Although they could even witness some of these killings on tape, none of the victims could even be identified. Since they couldn't determine a victim, they couldn't determine a crime. After accepting the plea deal for his daughter Jessie's release, he went back to court for sentencing eight months later. The judge handed him not only the maximum sentence, but added an additional third as aggravation for the brutality of his crimes, for a total of 223 years in prison. As David Parker Ray entered his cell in prison, he slumped over and died of a heart failure in 2002, having served less than a day of his formal sentence. The brutality and heinous nature of the crimes committed by David Parker Ray from the 1950s through 1999 is without parallel. His ability to con and charm people into his circle to become not only enablers, but vested accomplices is a testament to the effectiveness for persuasion that a charming psychopath can possess. Between the four known accomplices of these crimes, a combined approximate total of 34 years of prison time was served between them. Other than the late David Parker Ray himself, all of them walk free among us today. One might wonder what people as calculating and evil as these might do with their freedom. What darkness do they still harbor? What remorse do they feel for their actions? Although this is nigh unknowable to you or I, I do believe that we all must stand and account for our actions, whether in this life or the next. I'd like to thank you for spending your time with me today. I hope I've earned a subscription and a recommendation to your friends. That's insane. Your continued support and viewership of my content is more than enough, but for those of you who'd be interested... Nah, that's literally insane, bro. I, I, I'm like, I'm... We need to cleanse our palates right now. This is not, this isn't okay, bro. This is not okay, bro.